Only the low cost survive. I've been through many oil market cycles, and there is but one truth. Only the low cost survive. My first downturn was in 1985, when I was working for Imperial Oil in Toronto. The demand for oil at the time is around 40 million barrels per day, but the available supply is around 60, most of it from the Middle East. Since all that oil wants to be sold, the market collapses, and Brent falls from $30 US down to 10 Imperial Oil needs to cut costs, and launches an HR scheme called Career Change Assistance Program, or CCAP. A staffers call it CCAP, followed by kneecap, and, if you don't take it, decap. I am newly married, and in two weeks I'm supposed to transfer to the upstream unit in Calgary, but my transfer falls apart. Oil cycles get very personal, very quickly. It takes close to a decade for prices to recover. Imperial Oil survives because it moves decisively to keep its costs low and its debt restrained. When they happen, all oil market downturns seem unprecedented, but each downturn is unprecedented in its own particular way. For example, the price spike of 1973 was due to an unprecedented shortage of oil tankers to move crude to market. The market collapsed when new tankers finally arrived. In Canada, the industry has faced distressingly low prices since 2014 because of an unprecedented lack of space on pipelines. Today, in 2020, the downturn is about unprecedented changes in both demand and supply. The demand problem begins with the pandemic. Many other diseases kill more people each year, but in its short life, COVID-19 is now the fastest growing cause of death and unabated has the potential to be the leading cause of death globally. Here is the death rate in UK and Wales relative to the five-year average. As you can see from yellow to white, the gap is huge. The health system impacts are unprecedented and are more like what happens after a tsunami, an earthquake, or a tornado, but striking everywhere at once. Government lockdowns have triggered a recession. Global GDP will be down by 3% according to the International Monetary Fund. In comparison, it only fell 1.5% between 2008 and 2009, the time of the Great Financial Crisis. Global GDP is around $91 trillion, and 3% is about $3 trillion, which is about the GDP of the UK. Try to imagine the global economic contribution of the entire UK economy vanishing in 30 days. I'm already nostalgic for the warm beer. This decline across so many economies at the same time is unprecedented. Recessions mean fewer jobs, less commuting, less construction, fewer flights, lower investment, basically less of everything. OPEC thinks the demand for oil likely fell by roughly 20 million barrels per day for all of March and April. The drop in demand is unprecedented. Job losses in particular are horrific. The International Labour Organization estimates that globally, some three and a half, uh, th 305 million people will have lost their jobs to the end of June. Note here how services jobs, shown in yellow, generally speaking, uh, stay uh, strong even when manufacturing jobs dip. But this time, both have descended at the same pace. This is unprecedented. The livelihoods of 50% of the global workforce of 3.5 billion people who toil away in the informal economy are at risk of complete destruction. This much unemployment this quickly is unprecedented. In response, many economies are attempting to keep the lights on by injecting stimulus dollars into their markets. The Globe and Mail thinks the stimulus campaigns to be around $5 trillion, an unprecedented amount. Stimulus money helps keep businesses going when there are no customers, but that does not always translate into oil demand. I interviewed the CEO of a fuel delivery business based in Houston. His company has a clear eye on the demand for petroleum because he delivers it. And it's down. A lot. Diesel, gasoline, jet fuel, you name it. Just four months ago, his company would have been part of the services sector in oil and gas 
delivering over 22 million barrels of finished petroleum product in the U.S. domestic market every day, and that has fallen to 14 million barrels per day. To understand the supply mayhem, we need to step back to 2008. From 2008 to 2018, according to BP, North American oil supply has grown from roughly 13 million barrels per day to 22.6. This much growth, this quickly, is unprecedented. Meanwhile, Russian oil production has barely moved, from 12.7 million barrels per day to 14.5, and the supplies from the Middle East only grew from 26.5 million barrels per day to 31.7. North American oil production growth is greater than that from the Middle East and Russia combined. And it's all flowing to Asia, where purchases have grown from 26 million barrels per day to 36 in just a decade. American oil, that is relatively more expensive and technically complex to produce by its heavily indebted companies, has taken market share from Middle Eastern and Russian oil that is inexpensive and simple to produce from their state-sponsored companies. This might make sense if that expensive oil commanded a higher price because it was somehow qualitatively better, but it's not. By February of this year, the economic ravages of the pandemic and its impact on oil demand were starting to emerge. Remember, China is both the biggest buyer of oil globally and the starting point for the pandemic. China the customer and OPEC the supplier could see the impacts of China's lockdown before anyone else. But then Russia balks at OPEC's pleas for deeper cuts, and so the producers decide to flood the market with oil. Whether the oversupply is poor decision-making or a shrewd play to push the U.S. out of the market doesn't matter. Supply surges ahead of demand by 20 million barrels per day leaving heaving inventories of 1.2 billion barrels straining in storage. The speed of the inventory buildup is unprecedented. Now, the North American oil industry is in great pain. The fracking segment is already under siege because capital markets are increasingly suspicious about the fracking business model and the mountain of debt that these companies have taken on board. Frackers are not low-cost businesses, and many will not survive. Oil price is where this pandemic demand meets the war of supply. And here we can see the effects. The price of oil has fallen 85% within the year, from a high of $70.25 a barrel to as low as $9.12. And in some markets, under some conditions, the forward price has even been negative. This great a fall is not without precedent. It fell further in 2008 from a high of of $139 a barrel down to 45 but just not as quickly. The pain in the industry is not uniformly shared. 82% of the world's reserves are controlled by governance, governments that are highly dependent on the proceeds from oil sales and are relatively unresponsive to price moves, carbon pressures, activists, and capital markets. They are trimming to weather through, but they're not changing course. Unprecedented global recession, massive unemployment, heroic levels of stimulus, catastrophic demand collapse, heaving production oversupply, a colossal inventory buildup, and a dramatic price reset. In a word, unprecedented. There is always oil demand, but with this much market upheaval, only the low cost survive. Yogi Berra once said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Well, what facts out there need no prediction? Well, there are 1.2 billion cars in the world, 300 million heavy trucks, 53,000 merchant and military ships, and over 30,000 aircraft. In the main, they want to be put to work. There is oil demand. But now, there are a great many unknowns. How long will the virus be among us, unimpeded by vaccine or immunity? It takes years for vaccines to be tested and widely distributed. Will we see a continuous cycle of lockdowns and restarts as the virus explodes and recedes with accompanying oil market contractions? How quickly will economies recover? 
It took a decade from the bottom of the 2008 recession for the U.S. to be back to be full employment. Will businesses permanently change how they work, with more virtual and online workforces, less commuting, and a reduction in real assets? Will there be greater levels of automation? So far, robots and other digital innovations have not contracted the virus. Digital doesn't commute. How quickly will the inventories of crude oil and finished products be depleted? Inventories want to be sold, and they also impede fresh supplies. Will the Chinese government renew its push for electrified transportation to permanently bend its demand curve for oil? China is the only material growth market left. And finally, will OPEC and Russia ever again act in concert to keep expensive U.S. oil in the ground? How will we survive this? With cash now scarce, those with the lowest costs stand the best chance to survive. Wood Mackenzie analyzes the average production break-even cost by basin. And, at a price of $20 a barrel, and a demand of 80 million barrels per day, the basins to the left on this slide are those that are broadly economic, and those to the right are broadly uneconomic. The U.S. shale, the tight oils, is the big gold box. Six weeks ago, I ordered a set of blackout curtains from Amazon for my home office because the window lighting was really bad for my video conferences. I would normally have gone to the mall, but they're closed. I applied for and I received one of those stimulus loans from the government. Normally, I would have had to pay a visit to a bank or a government office, but banks and government offices now limit access. It was all done online. My in-person training course can handle 30 people at a time. But with the pandemic, there's no gatherings, no training. My online training course, though, has over 600 students from around the world paying in 30 different currencies. COVID-driven digital has radically transformed my work world in just eight weeks. This isn't just about Zoom. It's about robots, remote monitoring, and automation of all kinds. It's about collaboration tools like Slack, online shopping, and virtual classrooms. It's about online banking, online government services. It's about in-country manufacturing, 3D printing of N95 masks. Last week, I spoke with Jim, the CEO of a publicly traded company. His business supplies the upstream industry with drilling equipment. They started two years ago to transform their product line to incorporate digital innovations, such as remote monitoring and remote control. Now, his customers are demanding products that operate independently without forcing people to travel to work or to work even in close proximity to others. It's now clear that the adoption of new ways of working enabled by digital tools is a critical pathway to lower costs. Moreover, it turns out that the digital innovations I'm talking about are the key solution to solving the problems of the pandemic and the cost challenges of the industry. And they've been in front of us for a couple of years now. Those that embrace digital innovations see cost reductions of 20% or more and productivity gains of 20% or more. Some companies, like Repsol, have staked their future on achieving carbon neutrality, which can only be done if work processes that generate carbon are overhauled, at the same time solving for the pandemic and lowering costs. Only the low cost survive, and digital is the way forward.